All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I've heard so much about Shy Hack Night, and I'm excited about some of the collaborations that we are your officers and the officers, well, if you guys call them officers, uh, our organization, um, the officers of our organization, the National Association of Black Journalists are um, currently in talks about. Um, so looking forward to doing big things together. So um, a little bit about me. I am... Um, a columnist with the Sun-Times. I pen a column called Chicago Chronicles, and they are full-page, long-form pieces on people and places that make Chicago tick with a focus on black and brown communities. So, in other words, I try to counter the negative narratives and constant stream of murder and mayhem that you, the reader, get every day from my paper um, coming out of black and brown communities. I try to offer that one little pearl that you find in the newspaper on any given day that is a profile of someone you don't know who is doing something so ordinarily wonderful or wonderfully ordinary um, or something so amazingly miraculous in these neighborhoods um, that you will never hear about because we're so busy in the media covering the murder and the mayhem. So I've been doing that for about three years. And uh, prior to that, I covered um, every beat from education to politics to crime and police. Um, what else did I cover? Nonprofits. Um, just about every beat and urban affairs, covered housing. Um, my uh, tenure at the Sun-Times began in 1987, um, and I did 11 years at the Sun-Times covering all of those various beats. And at the end of those 11 years, I was covering the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. And I did so many stories about the horrible, tragic things that were occurring to children in the foster care system that um, it brought about some changes at the state legislative le legislature level. And the director of the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services called me one day and said, hey, I'd love to have you on this side of the pen. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, it takes a few asks and after three or four times turning them down, um, the offer was right. There's always a right offer. <laughs> and so I left and I crossed over into what we call the dark side in journalism, which is public relations, right? And I did that for two years. I was press secretary for Governor Edgar's DCFS for two years. Governor Edgar decided not to run again. So I decided to hang my own shingles and started my own PR firm, the Hedrick Media and Communications Group. I did that for three years, and because I'd been in politics, I handled the media affairs of um, U.S. Congress people, uh, Illinois legislative people, and city councilmen and women. So I stayed in politics, and during the three years that I ran my own business, my claim to fame was managing the re-election campaign of uh, U.S. Representative Bobby Rush against a little-known uh, politician by the name of Barack Obama. It was the only race that Mr. Obama would lose on his upward trajectory to the presidency. Yes. <laughs> and um, I did that for, like I said, three years, and then I missed writing. And I went knocking on the door of the Sun-Times, and I started to, I begged for my old job back. Um, I got my job back, and once again, I went through all of those beats that I just talked about. And uh, right about 2012, I was covering urban affairs again, my second time around. And urban affairs happens to be my favorite beat. It's my favorite beat because it's where all of the issues that we all talk about in mainstream society, it's where they all intersect in the inner city. So 
Um, when we talk about urban affairs, we're talking about covering you know, urban areas and inner cities. And so um, when you talk about the uh, status of the inner city, you're talking about low quality of education. Chicago public schools, students graduating high school, unable to read at level. We are talking about disinvestment, um, economic development. We're talking about communities where the landscape is pockmarked with vacant lots, boarded up buildings, and um, very, very, very few businesses, and very, very, very few jobs. We're talking about politics because everything boils down to politics. Um, you know, when you have a huge swath of the west side, North Lawndale, that was burned down during the 68 riot, and today looks not much different than it did in the aftermath. Um, that's talking about political will. Because if there was a will, there would be a way. Those communities should have changed long ago. I proffer to you, as example, the South Loop of Chicago. The South Loop was Skid Row only a few short years ago. I offer to you the near west side of Chicago. The near west side was Skid Row, with homeless people sleeping in the streets, prostitutes walking its streets. And a few short years later, because there is a will, those communities are completely unrecognizable. They are completely developed. They're filled with vibrant businesses, restaurants, nightlife, and new housing. And uh, in some of those communities, you can't find housing now for less than $500,000. So what I'm saying to you is that if there is a will, there is a way. It depends on politics. So all of those things, of course, crime, violence, one of the biggest issues facing the inner city today and facing Chicago as a whole, um, crime and policing, community and police relations, all of those things intersect in the inner city and in urban affairs, which is why I love that beat. There's never a dull moment and there's never ever two stories that are the same. If you're in politics, I would venture to say to you that if you've heard it once, you've heard it, before, you, you don't need to hear it again. They say the same things over and over. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the mayoral election. So, um, I was covering urban affairs my second time around for about three or four years, and then my boss said, you know, one of the things that uh, the media is criticized for, and most certainly the Sun-Times and the Tribune, is that when you open up our newspapers, all you get when you see a black and brown face is someone who has been arrested of a crime. And all you get is a steady stream of negativity. And we were being lambasted and criticized mercilessly by the community. And we deserved it. All media deserve it. And so my boss you know, said, you know, Maudlin, you're a great writer. Why don't we start a different column? Why don't we do something different? Um, why don't we do something that actually goes out into those neighborhoods and finds the untold stories, the stories that no one will ever tell? Because, you know, quite frankly, we in the media, we're stretched thin. There's not a lot of time to just let someone go out into the neighborhood and, and find great little diamonds of stories. And um, it was a major, major commitment on the part of my newspaper and my former boss, and so Chicago Chronicles was born. I, um, one of the, the major challenges of my column is finding a different way to tell the story of Chicago violence. On any given day, I am searching for the words that will move you, the reader, to not be jaded, that will move you, the reader, to care about one more child that's been shot, about one more mother or grandmother in their living room, for God's sake, when the stray bullet came in. I am always trying to find a way to reach you. Because as I mentioned before, without political will, these things will not change. And the only thing that creates political will is you. 
If you care, if you push your political representatives to make a change, the only time they will make a change is when, well, we know, when they feel that they're at risk of losing their position. And so I have to figure out how to tell that story. And frequently, the way I do it is by trying to put a human face on the violence. Um, I was trying to email some stories <laughs> that I could pull out to show you, but that didn't happen. So, um, you know, it's just really all about finding the right lead to draw you in, um, the right words, the right description, so that it's more than just crime. It's more than just another story. Um, you feel it. You feel it. You're moved and you want things to change. I'll back up a little bit. Before I got to the Sun-Times, one of the things that we hear about often are that newspaper, no, are that journalists must be objective. Yes, journalists must be objective. But one of the things that we've come to realize in recent years is that no one can be completely objective. What do I mean by that? I'm not saying we're all running around with our biases trying to cram it down your throat. What I am saying is that I am a composite of everything I have been through and everything that I am. Meaning, the things I care about, the subjects I choose to write about, what I tend to lead with and what I tend to leave you with at the end of a story, all that is based on who I am. So who am I? Well, on June 9, 1969, a mother and a ragtag group of five children, refugees of the Nigerian Biafran War, arrived at O'Hare International Airport to a horde of newspapers and television stations. They were the rare arrival from the fledgling nation of Biafra which was mired in brutal civil war after seceding from Nigeria in 1967. That ragtag family included my mother, Angelina Ihejerika, my four siblings, and myself, age five. So who am I? I am a refugee. Yes. So who am I? I am an immigrant, yes. So my family was helped to escape the war because my father was here studying at Northwestern University when the war broke out. And he could not return home to Nigeria. When his grades started to fall because he was here on a US scholarship, the dean of Kellogg School of Management approached him, who was his mentor, and said, what's going on? You're going to lose your scholarship. And he told him the story, that he had not heard from his wife and kids in nearly two and a half years, and he did not know if they were alive or dead. Well, at this point, the images of starving women and children who were no more than skin and bones with distended bellies suffering from a condition called kwashoka. It's where the stomach turns on itself and begins to eat itself when there is no food until the person is no more than skin and bones. And when those images began to be beamed into living rooms across the globe, it was, as in so many civil wars in Africa, the world stood by and said, we cannot get involved. It was not until the world understood from those images that genocide was taking place, that the world began to move. And they still said, we cannot get involved, but what we will do is we will send food. And so the world began food drops, from Europe to America to other Western and African nations. They began to drop food into Biafra. Because of the images that were being beamed into living rooms, the dean said to my father, you've seen the footage 
I think you need to accept that your wife and kids are most likely dead. And my father said, you don't know my wife. Well, the dean and his wife and four other couples on the North Shore, they invited my father to Thanksgiving dinner and they tried to console him. And he got to know these five couples. And they would invite him out for various things and they kind of adopted him. And then one day, my mother, who was trying to keep six small children alive during a brutal war, that saw the massacre and starvation of two million of my tribe, the Igbo tribe. She had been going to church daily during a war because she was indoctrinated by the missionaries. Post-colonization, colonialization. And so she met a nun who befriended her and when she told the nun her situation that she did not know if her husband knew that she was alive and that she could die and we could die and he never know how long she'd held on. The nun said, I have an idea. Write a letter, don't address the envelope, and I will send that letter to my missionary uh, brother in one European country I will have him send it to my missionary nun sister in another European country, and then she, I will ask her to forward that letter back into Sierra Leone, which was the neighboring country where my father had originally gone to study at the University of Fur Bay. And then when the war broke out and he couldn't return home, he applied for a scholarship from the US and was accepted at Northwestern. They did that. The letter arrived at the University of Fur Bay, only to find my father no longer there. The letter was forwarded to my father at Northwestern, and when it arrived in his hands, he ran into his dean's office and said, see, I told you you didn't know my wife. And they were all so moved, these five couples, by the fact that they did believe this family was dead, and by the conviction of my father, that they joined together in the most heroic of feats to find and locate my family in the midst of a raging war, and then to effect our escape to the US. Hence, we arrived on June 9, 1969. My life, the very breath I breathe, I owe to five white couples on the North Shore of Chicago who knew not race, who knew not geography, only shared humanity. They did not know this African child halfway across the globe, but they believed that one person could make a difference. 50 years later, I have finally told the story of my mother, an amazing woman who survived two and a half years of grisly war while two million died around her. So who am I? I am someone who when I hear the anti-immigrant, anti-refugee backlash that has taken hold in American political discourse is disheartened, saddened, and anguished. Because there, for the grace of God, go I. You can argue immigration reform all day long. I will not argue that with you but I will argue with you that every nation must do its part to confront a refugee crisis, the likes of which we have not seen since World War II. I offer to you that 68 million people across the globe, let me rephrase that, one in 122 People across the globe are currently displaced by civil war, natural disasters. We're talking about people who have no place to return home. So that when we say we will not accept refugees, we will not accept our share of refugees, 
Where do we expect these people to go? We're talking one in 122 people. Every nation must do their share. But back to who am I? So all of those experiences is who I am. So when I write about immigration, when I write about refugee issues, am I objective? I am objective to the point where I will tell both sides and I will tell the story and I will give you the facts. But I am biased in the fact that I choose to write those stories. I don't have to write those stories. There's a million stories and there are very little resources. So when I, as a reporter, say to my boss, I'd like to do this story, I've already exercised my inherent bias. When I write that story and I humanize that face and I go and find the mother and child from Syria and tell their story, the way I write that story, the fact that I choose a mother and children, what I lead with, what I end with, I have already exercised my bias. So yes, I'm objective because I will tell you all aspects of that story. I will tell you the pros, I will tell you the cons, I will tell you why people don't want refugees, I will tell you why people say we have to accept refugees, but the fact that I'm telling you, period, is my bias, it is my choice, because I feel those stories need to be told and because I hope to reach you. And I hope that you will start to look at these issues that I care about in a different way. So that's what I do. I write about stories that I have a passion for. And the good news is that since being promoted to a column, I no longer have to pretend to be objective. I can write about whatever the heck I want to write about, and I can tell you my opinion, and if you don't like it, don't read my column. People get to know who you are through your column, and they get to know what side of the fence you're on, and what your leaning is. And I don't apologize for it, because I have colleagues who lean the complete opposite direction, go read them. But my point of view is that every point of view must be shared. So that's my story, 25 years at the Sun-Times, and today I just, I just try to make a difference. All I want to do is make a difference. There are not many people who have a platform like journalism from which to speak. And so, as my mother always told me growing up, to whom much is given, much is expected, and because I stand here speaking to you, grateful to ordinary strangers for saving the very life I have, much is expected, and I must make a difference, and I must use my pen to try to do that. Thanks for listening. Hello. Um, so you've covered many stories over the course of your career. I was wondering if there was a story or a few that stand out in particular that um, kind of exemplify uh, Chicago or Chicago history to you. Well, I think that there have been many stories of Chicago's violence that exemplify Chicago's history to me. And also the fact that the more things change, the more things stay the same. I was covering Chicago violence when Cabrini Green was the most violent public housing development in the nation, when Robert Taylor Holmes was the biggest public housing development going on for miles down State Street and rampant with crime. And there were many, many, many famous, it's a terrible word, um, you know, violence cases that came out of those public housing developments. This was the early 90s when I was covering it. Um, and, 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 and so then you come 20 years later, and I'm still covering it. The public housing developments have been knocked down, but now I'm covering them in the neighborhoods. So some of those stories are the ones that stay with me the most. Um, 
The one uh, that comes to mind, Dantrell Davis. He was a six-year-old who was walking to school in Cabrini Green in the um, early 90s when a sniper, um, a gang member aiming for another gang member, um, missed and shot him in the head. And um, those are the, those are the, those are the kind of stories, sorry. Those are the kind of stories that stay with you. Um, and uh, it led to a major change in Cabrini Green. It was right after that that Mayor Jane Byrne decided she was going to move into Cabrini Green because something needed to be done. And people shouldn't live this way. Um, what I'll say to you is that fast forward 15 years later, and there's a similar story that I will never forget. And it is a six-year-old boy, another six-year-old boy, whose parents were engaged in a gang, food, gang feud. And one gang member approached the six-year-old boy as he played in the playground, lured him into an alley with a basketball. And when he got into the alley, shot the six-year-old in the head. Another case that agonized this city. And those are the kind of cases when you cover this kind of violence day after day after day, you get jaded. And sometimes you struggle to find the words that are going to move anyone because you've got to be moved. You're so numb. But stories like that, every once in a while, they shake you to your core. They shake you out of that jaded feeling, and you're just like shaking, like, this happened. So yeah, those kind of stories. Thank you. This is amazing to hear your story and, and all the work you've done. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Daryl Holiday from City Bureau come and present here. Uh, and I'm kind of curious your take on the sort of new group of folks who are really trying to change the face of journalism in Chicago and, and how you perceive that having an impact on, on the journalism landscape in Chicago. But I think they also have obviously national uh, objectives as well. I'm kind of curious to hear your take on Exactly. Um, over the course of 25 years, I've seen the journalism landscape change dramatically. Um, it's a well-known secret that the internet killed newspapers, magazines, and uh, made it very difficult for broadcast outlets as well. So um, in this city alone, we've had both newspapers in bankruptcy within the last seven years. Um, newspapers across the country have folded, and it has ended up now a survival of the fittest. Um, newspapers, just like broadcast outlets, are having to reinvent themselves and find new ways to reach the reader. Um, we have to find you wherever you are, so we follow you to every platform. We follow you to Facebook, and I remember when my boss told all of us, everyone's got to be on Facebook. And we were like, oh man, you know. And we all went on Facebook. And a few years after that, it was like, okay, everyone's got to be on Twitter. What? Okay. So then we went to Twitter. They're like, we're like, why? Because now only your grandmother's on Facebook. So now we're all on Twitter. And then a few years after that, what? Yeah, you know, everyone's got to go to Instagram. Why do we have to go to Instagram? Because now your grandmother's on Twitter. So, yeah, so social media has also had a huge impact on the way we deliver news. But what does that all mean? It means that um, you as the reader have a lot more choices in where you can go to get that news. And um, you can exercise your choice in terms of what you want to see in your, in your media. And um, a lot of uh, readers are saying, you know, we're, we're not wedded to the legacy media outlets anymore. Um, they're all more of the same. Some of the things that I just was talking about, they're all murder and mayhem and negative news. Um, or, you know, if you are conservative, um, uh, you will read the Tribune. If you are liberal, you will read the Sun-Times. Um, so you're making those choices. But when people begin to leave the legacy outlets, there's a void. 
they're looking for something, and particularly the critical millennial generation. That's the generation that all of us as journalists, all of us as news outlets are going after. Um, because those people who are our generation who grew up on the, the legacy outlets, they're dying off. And so your generation and the millennials, Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, you know, they don't read the newspaper and they don't really watch the news. So there's a void and that's where outlets like Daryl's and many other um, uh, internet startups have been able to find a niche. Um, they've been able to create media that is tailored to what they see as missing in the market. And uh, Daryl's done a fantastic job. He has created something that um, has really uh, resonated. Um, and his focus, of course, is community. The community telling its own stories. And, 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 and there's a whole segment of the population that completely believes that or completely has no trust of legacy media. They don't trust them. And so this whole concept of the community telling its own stories has resonated. And there are so many more like that. You know, that's how you have Politico, that's how you have ProPublica, that's, that's how you have uh, DNA that uh, uh, folded. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there, you're going to see a whole lot more of that as the media landscape continues to splinter um, and as um, more of uh, the readers and the viewers go looking for uh, what fits them personally and um, someone will step up to fill that. I think we have time for one more question. First of all, thank you for your talk. Um, question, so you said a lot of things um, have changed and a lot of things have stayed the same. You mentioned what's stayed the same, but what sorts of things have changed um, in your time covering this city? Hmm. Well, um, in 25 years, what has changed? Well, I will say that um, the, the, the power structure uh, remains the same, but the the, the, the access to power has changed. The, 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 the avenue through which um, power is accessed has changed. Um, when I started in this, in this business, Chicago was run by the Chicago machine, right? Um, and uh, it was very tightly, power was very tightly held. You had to go and kiss the ring um, within, uh, you know, uh, with the ward bosses, and the ward bosses took their instruction from this person who took their instruction from that person. And even though you had 50 aldermen, they all took their instruction from the same, the same you know, one vessel um, as you moved up the food chain. Um, and so things did not change. Um, but now, now, yes, there's, 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 there's a wider vessel for access to power. Uh, the machine is dead. A little, <laughs> and um, and so uh, there, there's uh, this this uh, this city has uh, seen a uh, spurt of independent politics. Um, we are a city that, uh, over the course of my 25 years, um, saw the first black mayor elected in 1983. And uh, when I first started, I, there's no you know there's no way that um, uh, when, I, when I was coming up, rather, there was no way I thought I would ever see that. And then um, it is a city that elected the very first black um, U.S. Congress, I mean, U.S. Senator, and that was Carol Mosley Braun. And uh, when I was in my early years, you know, that would never have happened because you, you, you couldn't even become an alderman unless the ward bosses said you could, right? Before, you know, much less U.S. Senator. And then finally, um, uh, much later, um, 2008, it is a city that birthed the very first black president. So um, what has changed? The access to power, the political landscape, it has yielded. And there is now um, a lot of room for independent politics, for progressives, um, and, and you, get a, you get a diverse set of views. And in that uh, city council where you have 50 aldermen, it's no longer all 50 reporting to one. You know, um, 
there's still some of that, you know, aspect where, yeah, you vote with the mayor if you want to make sure you get your dollars for your ward and all that. Some of that still goes on, but that's what I've seen change over the course of 25 years is, is the political landscape in Chicago. You know, Chicago was the most segregated city in America in the 1970s, and um, some argue it still is, but, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of change, a lot of change in that way. Everyone, please give it up again.